In uncertain times, we embrace fear, like an old ghost whose silhouette we've seen in our childhood terrors. There is something familiar, even comforting, about succumbing to what we've succumbed to a thousand times before. Fear is an old friend. At the whim of a global pandemic, many of us feel the cold sting of what we took for granted about normal life. We pick up the pieces of what remains, trying to create a familiar picture. The unlucky ones, those falling through the cracks of society, wonder if they will ever get back to theirs. To them, this is not just abnormal or disruption, it is survival. Then there are those whose wealth allows them to watch the ruin from ivory towers. Regardless of which class we fall into, all of us must sit with the anxiety, the inevitable deaths of relatives or friends. We are brought to an abrupt reacquaintance with mortality, and whether or not we shook hands with death before, we will be given the opportunity to once again make our peace with her now. But the inevitability is already a reality for many. So here we are, clumsily holding the broken pieces of human fragility, wondering why something we absently thought was invulnerable is now cutting our skin with fragmented shards. Outside of the imperative of emergency personnel, art rises up from the darkness. Through writing, illustrations, and every medium, artists everywhere rediscover the purpose of their craft. To pause, reflect, and connect when everything else halts. Amidst catastrophe and tragedy, as we slowly adjust to losing some of our day-to-day -day luxuries, we realize that despite everything, as long as we can continue to create, we are as alive as ever. Life is far from over. The new normal is just different. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and these are the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Eam, a small village in the overgrown hills of Derbyshire, England, had a population of around 400 in the year 1665. Besides the late August heat and discontentment amongst the villagers for their current rector, nothing was amiss. Their lives unfurled in their daily routines. The unchanging pace of time continued at its usual perplexing rate of rotting. With long days, hard labor, and the paradox of evening hours stretching on and the sun roaring into view in the mornings. Yet in a week's time, their simplistic pastoral living would be transformed. They would wonder how they ever let those uncomplicated days slip through their fingers. They would wonder why they had wished time would pass quicker, especially soon, when even moments of extraordinary torment would somehow be made precious. On the evening of August 31st, a mass of dark clouds formed on the horizon, reaching out like a sea of hands. They would take those moments they neglected to appreciate, and leaving in their place a hell beyond reckoning. And all it would take is a single roll of cotton. George Vickers was a tailor temporarily working in the town of Eam. Amongst his supplies was a shipment of cotton, a single roll of it which had become damp during travel and harbored a nest of fleas. They were the vessel for the bubonic plague. Upon arriving with the cloth and noticing that it was damp, Vickers hanged it to dry over a roaring hearth. That single action is what sealed the fate of Eam damning the villagers to fourteen months of excruciating pain, tragedy, and a trial of faith which could only be rewarded with death. Hardly a week had passed before George Vickers succumbed to the plague. On September 7, 1665, Eam buried their first victim. Whether they knew it or not, their village now belonged to the plague, and within a year's time, it would be the dead, not the living, who primarily occupied its soil. The first string of death struck the Hadfield Cooper household, killing off a four-year-old on September 22nd, followed by a 12-year-old brother on October 2nd. Their father was to come a year later, leaving the mother to be the only survivor and sole keeper of grief in its wake. 
But such instances became the rule rather than the exception, with households being snatched up from the plague in a matter of months, sometimes less. Those who survived did so, bearing the inconceivable weight of loss, and the isolation of keeping company with ghosts. In the hot weather, the fleas were more active, allowing the pestilence to spread unchecked throughout the village. But there are glimmers of intrigue in what appears to be a common retelling of what happens when a plague strikes at a time when modern medicine was far from the horizon. Ian was different, not because few members of the village survived its spread, nor because the disease killed off three quarters of its population. In essence, it is not remarkable that they died. But how? Autumn arrived at Eam with its share of storms and shedding leaves. But the metaphor for the impending winter and the decay of life could not have been made more appropriate, for it was at this time that Eam saw its first rash of deaths. Yet winter would prove to be a forgiving, if not perplexing, time. The plague slowed. Deaths lessened. The frigid air did its part in halting some of the common processes which contributed to the spread of the disease namely, the slowed activity of the fleas which had been introduced months before. In dealing with the dead, this would mean the dull, nauseating smells of human decomposition would be less potent, with the chilled air helping to arrest decay. It would also mean less activity amongst the villagers. But winter would ultimately be a cruel joke played on Eam, when the budding of spring, fresh starts, and new life would also bring with it the most destruction. If nowadays we find navigating a pandemic to be odd, we can only imagine the sheer panic four centuries ago. In a time when witchcraft was a common explanation for failed crops and even miscarriages, we needn't strain our imagination to discover just how confused the next months became. In finding a culprit, the villagers accused everything from swamp fumes to impure living. They scrambled to make sense of an origin and were further befuddled in finding that many who had direct contact with the diseased died soon after, yet mysteriously, others who did exactly the same would somehow never contract it or simply survive its course. There seemed no rhyme or reason to it, except the village came to realize that once the plague infiltrated a house, it would soon overcome the majority of the family or take all their lives outright. The only remaining conclusion was contact. Reverend William Mompesson was the newly appointed rector for the village. His predecessor, Thomas Stanley, a Puritan minister, was ejected from his post and forced to live at the edge of the village. Yet William's reception was not any friendlier due to his lack of cooperation with changing rituals and church ceremonies. Not only was he dancing on eggshells with his newfound responsibilities, but he carried the burden of taking command in a catastrophe with no answer. None except one. Given the limited medical knowledge of the time, the solution that the rector Reverend Mopison and Thomas Stanley proposed was truly groundbreaking. Though the plague had slowed its death toll, Eam knew it wasn't out of the woods yet. The two clergymen suggested the reality we are all living in now. On June 24th, 1666, they set in place a quarantine. Eam would have to dig its heels in, almost literally, as they plowed a circle to create a border for the settlement. No one was to go in or out of the village for the 14 months that the plague took hold. The rector vowed to stay with the community, a decision which shared some similarities to nailing down your own coffin and paying for the burial service. The reception to the plan was scattered. They understood that this was no act of self-preservation, but sacrifice to limit the spread of the pathogen to nearby villages. This was not a plan of survival, but to die quietly, together, in an effort to take the plague with them to their graves. Mompesson and Stanley fought for this decision, eventually winning over nearly all, if not all, of the villagers. With the decision agreed upon by the population, the air of everyday life became even more somber. A dance with death choreographed such that there was no winners, save for the lives outside of Eam. <laughs> 
but isolation would be one of the least shocking changes to the villagers' everyday lives. The bubonic plague was not only deadly, but torturous. Its victims developed boils which could turn necrotic or rotten, the extent of which would turn the boils black, and throughout this process, they would seep pus, even blood. And these open wounds are what allowed the plague to become septicemic, meaning it would infiltrate the bloodstream, and from there, have the victim finished off in as little as three days, but often even less. To illustrate this, we must turn our focus to Elizabeth Hancock. In the blistering summer of August 1666, a year after the plague's arrival, death did not so much creep into her home, rather gush through every crack and windowpane. Elizabeth had six children and a husband, and within only eight days, she had lost all of them. One of the conditions of their quarantine meant that the task of burying her dead fell on her shoulders and hers alone. In the late summer evenings when dawn was held off by slow sunsets, Elizabeth would wrap her children in thin cotton sheets. She would tie a knot on either end, one above the feet and one above the head, and, clutching the knots like handles, carry her children out onto a nearby field to place them beneath the ground. The sheets would be painted by the palette of colors which corpses so commonly leave behind, colors of dirt, dirtied yellows, green of bile, and the singing scarlet of blood. People from a nearby village, Stony Middleton, watched Elizabeth labor over her family's remains from a nearby hill, too frightened to help. The senses go numb in trying to imagine the grief she felt. Was it easier when the rest of her family was alive after the first death? How did it feel carrying the fourth, fifth, and sixth child? As that hellish week carried on, Elizabeth must have become familiar to that dread one feels when they stumble over the realization that the sleeping loved one they are looking at is not, in fact, merely sleeping. That they are no longer looking at a child or husband, rather a pale and crude caricature which death has left behind in their place. Their hands would have been light, like blistered rose petals left scattered in the wake of a storm. Their blood would have gotten on her fingers and clothes, left stains that would be difficult to scrub off, and images that were impossible to forget. The hardest physical task would be her husband's body, perhaps as much as twice her weight, but even the difficult job of negotiating him from the house would have been a poor comparison to the pain she carried inside. Nothing is more difficult than seeing the motionless expressions on the faces of those who we grew used to seeing fully animated, let alone being consigned to the horrors of discovering just how inhuman a human body is. Seven corpses, seven burials, seven uncooperative pairs of limbs and hands hanging off bedsides. Elizabeth would have been lucky to have been haunted by the ghosts of her family. Far worse was waking up to the reality of never seeing them again, except in the irrepressible memories of their faces staring up at nothing as she carried them to a shallow grave. This was the village's plan in order to save the lives of others, to suffer, perish, and bury their dead alone. This was their curse, their mortal sacrifice. But Elizabeth's nightmare was not uncommon. At the peak of the plague's spread, entire families were wiped out, there were others who survived contact with the diseases like Elizabeth, or in even stranger cases still, those who contracted the plague, but survived. One such soul was Marshall Ho. Believing he could not be infected twice, he eventually volunteered for the task of burying the rest of the village's dead. It's said he even came to relish his job, seeing it as a kind of duty after having survived. But his virtue in this was short-lived, as he would help himself to the belongings of those he carried away, especially if the rest of their family was not alive to account for the missing possessions. But even the gravedigger was not spared. Before long, just like Elizabeth, he was enduring the lonely work of burying his two-year-old child and wife, Joan. Throughout this time, those who continued to survive felt no luckier than the dead. Paranoia haunted them constantly. The likely cause of their demise sat in every shadow 
and stared up at them from the waxy sheen of cloudy, still eyes. The Reverend Mompesson wrote in his diary during the outbreak, I am a dying man, despite having no symptoms. Life continued in a most unprecedented and grim way for the citizens of Im. For getting goods into the village, a shopping list of sorts would be left for brave or perhaps desperate merchants at a well on the outskirts of the village. A bowl of water and vinegar housed coins as payment, which was thought to be a kind of disinfectant. Once again, we can be somewhat astounded by the intuition of our ancestors. Vinegar does, in fact, kill off about 90% of germs. It doesn't hold a candle to modern-day chemicals, but they made as good a choice as they could have. Other supplies were left at another landmark, the Boundary Stone, which was set somewhere between Eam and Stony Middleton. By the autumn of 1666, what was an unendurable nightmare became a mere shadow of what it was, a phantom slowly dissipating from everyday life. On November 1st, Abraham Mordom gasped his final breath, the last of the 273 people to die. Though the pestilence had trapped its final victim, the tragedy merely finished one chapter and started another. Those 14 months left unbearable memories behind, ones that could not be buried beneath six feet of soil. Thank you for listening to this pandemic special of Mania. I hope the information is not relevant to the modern listener for too long. Before we get into tidying the crypts, let's dig into some final details concerning this dark gem of 17th century England history. As a listener might be able to tell, there are no exaggerations regarding the conditions or extremes of this story. Most of us are familiar with the Black Plague and the horrors it wreaked on cities. Strangely enough, Eam's mortality rates were significantly higher than that of London's during this time. However, the quarantine measures the village took were not in vain, and undoubtedly prevented scores of deaths in nearby areas. It was, in one way or another, a kind of death pact taken on behalf of them all. Luckily, today's quarantine with the coronavirus doesn't ask that we die alone. Just live alone. But in modern times, Eam is no less popular for what it endured. Stories like these and extensive lessons on the area's history are carried out constantly in the village where it all happened, at least when there isn't a global pandemic happening. Not far from where Elizabeth Hancock buried her family is a graveyard called Riley Graves. It is now a National Trust monument. There, as well as in several places throughout the village, there are plaques commemorating some of the people who died. And those who died is another prudent topic. It should be noted that the population numbers at this time aren't clear, and vary anywhere between 350 to 800. Either way, the mortality rate is still staggering, if not for the factual stories which came from them. And lastly is a frivolous detail I find sort of irresistible to cover. Concerning the gravedigger, Marshall Ho, various recounts seem fond of adding the sting of justice to his part of the story. They proposed that he carried the disease into his house because of the stolen belongings brought inside. I find that whole notion a bit appalling, really. Not only because it is impossible the villagers in these times practiced modern sanitation, but also because there is no good or evil to the story, and no real justice to be had. The instinct to put a get-what-you-deserve sticker on Marshall comes across as crass at best, as it's more than likely, stolen goods or not, the disease would have found its way to his family, one way or another. After all, the man volunteered to take care of the town's very infected and very dead victims. Anyways, I apologize for the rant, but I just had to get that off my chest. It was annoying coming across that in my research over and over again. If you'd like a free book on the house, head on over to audibletrial.com forward slash mania. Once again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash mania. Not only will you be enjoying an audiobook of your choosing, but you'll be supporting the show while you read. In an effort to clean out my crypts, I'll be looking to thank all of the supporters of Mania. Their contributions to the show make a gigantic difference. And that brings us to a small announcement. If you don't know Astrid Grimm, she is a talented artist who works closely with me on my stories. She and I are looking to start developing merchandise, prints, and artwork for Mania. Time and production costs are only going to come in higher demand, so those who are supporting the show, however you do it, 
are truly the lifeblood behind expediting the process of these projects. A big part of my Patreon is explaining to listeners that Mania is merely the beginning for other stories and works of art. I don't want to make any promises yet, but this is the infant stage of some of those visions starting to crawl. If you are not supporting Mania, but are looking to get your hands dirty in the ditches with me, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash harlequin grim. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash harlequin grim. If you can spare the cost of a single cup of coffee for even a month, it goes a long way. Otherwise, you can rate the show wherever you listen to it, leave a review, or simply bring it up at your next sacrificial gathering. Since most of us are sitting at home all day anyways, it's a great time to share a link to a friend who might otherwise pursue their own demise out of sheer boredom. And once again, thank you so much for listening to Mania. I really mean it. My thoughts go out to everybody affected during these strange days. But, pandemic or not, I do sincerely hope you'll join me next time.